Welcome everybody to Tuesday Evenings at the Modern. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Education. Um, thank you um, to our sponsor and longtime friend of Glass Tire. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight, um, whether here with us in, this in the lovely Ondo designed auditorium at the Modern or with us through live stream. We're glad to have you. We are gathered near and far tonight um, to gain insight into um, a fine-tuned, laser-focused um, project of Rice Gallery at Rice University in Houston under the leadership of Kimberly Davenport. And to celebrate the publication of this beautiful book, One Thing Well, um, 22 Years of Installation Art, with text by an impressive array of writers, including uh, Kimberly Davenport, and edited by none other than Rainey Knudsen. Uh, Rainey Knudsen, based in Houston, is of course the founding editor of Glass Tire, um, the um, oldest online-only art magazine in the country, um, and as noted, a longtime friend and supporter of this program. Um, retired from her position as publisher at Glass Tire in 2019, Rainey now serves on Glass Tire's um, boards of directors as well as that of the Houston Seminar and on the advisory boards of Rice University School of Humanities and UCross Foundation in, Wy in uh, Wyoming. With uh, an insatiable intrigue for art and specifically um, the visual arts in Texas, Rainey has spoken and written about art for publications and institutions across the country uh, and is currently editing um, a book for Glass Tire or On Glass Tire um, while writing a performance piece about the online publication and the, devel and the development of the internet, um, exercising her creativity in relation to uh, Glass Tire. Kimberly Davenport is ultimately who brought us here all here tonight as, the, um, as she founded Rice University Art Gallery as a contemporary art space um, dedicated to site-specific installations in 1995 and served as its director for more than two decades. With um, degrees from Maryland Institute College of Art and Yale University, Kim came to uh, rise from um, the Wadsworth uh, Museum of Art in Hartford, um, considering uh, mandates and input and the resources at hand in uh, determining the direction of Rice Gallery, Kim landed on uh, what she describes in the opening of her essay for the book as, quote, a simple idea. We will do one thing and we will do it well. And the rest is history. Um, a history that will unfold in tonight's conversation between Rainey Knudsen and Kimberly Davenport. So before turning the program over to them, please join me in a warm welcome of Rainey and Kim. Hello, everybody. Uh, before we uh, talk about the subject at hand, I just want to take a moment to thank the Fort Worth Modern and, of course, the wonderful Terry Thornton here. And um, I'm al I always say this, but it's always true. Um, you all are so lucky to have this institution in your backyards. We are all lucky to have the Fort Worth Modern in Texas, but I would love to have this fantastic museum close by. And this wonderful Tuesday night lecture program is one of the best things in Texas and indeed anywhere. So. Thank you so much, Terry, for having us. It's wonderful to be here again. Okay, so um, quickly, I'm Rainey Knudsen, and this is Kimberly Davenport. And um, I, well, I thought we'd start with just a, a little bit about the book itself. We're here because this new book has come out about the Rice Gallery. And just as a bit of background about it, I um, went to Rice, and I graduated, unfortunately, two years before Kim Davenport arrived at Rice and took what had been a pretty sleepy little art department gallery with you know a very mixed bag of um, exhibitions and turned it into a powerhouse, um, small but mighty space that was so well respected for those of us who were following 
art in Houston in the late 90s and the aughts and in the teens, you know, the Rice Gallery was a not to be missed space. And it enjoyed that reputation throughout Texas and indeed nationally as well. And Kim did that um, in two ways. She, she transformed that gallery, number one, as, as Terry said, through this truly flash of genius insight. Um, all good ideas, you know, seem obvious once they're there, but in retrospect, um, you know, it, it wasn't obvious at the time to focus the mission on installation art, and Kim had the insight to do this in the space. It would have been kind of a little bit of an unloved or disregarded space, and I think, she, and she did that for practical and, um, as you'll see, architectural reasons, you know, came to that decision. And so they, uh, the, the Rice Gallery only did site-specific installation, and there were no just paintings on walls or sculptures on pedestals. Artists were invited to consider the whole volume of the space. And the second thing that Kim did, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can embarrass her a little bit here, was she has an absolutely extraordinary curatorial eye. And if you look at this book, these 72 installations in the book, these are artists who, many of whom went on to have huge careers and have blown up internationally. And for many of them, this was their first uh, time to exhibit in Texas um, or even a few in the, in the United States, period. And so, you know, El Anatsui's first uh, public art installation in the United States was at Rice Gallery. Yayo Kasama's first Texas exhibition was at Rice Gallery, and there are, there are many, many more um, like that. So Kim took something that wasn't that special and wasn't that great and made it very, very special. And so as I was stepping down from Glass Tiger in 2019, she came to me and said there was interest in doing this book and there was funding for it and would I work on it? And I leapt at the chance because it was a dream project for me coming off of Glass Tire to get to work with Kim, who I liked and respected so much, and also delve into this archive and work on this book. And so here we are now, and the book is done, um, but we thought we'd start talking about the gallery itself. And um, Kim tells, Kim, you tell a wonderful story about coming to Rice for the first time. So when you came to the Rice Gallery for the first time, it was your first trip to Houston, right? Um, yes. I mean, it's probably a pretty typical story. Uh, if anyone here lived back east and moved to Texas, um, uh, I have to say, you know, if you, if you do live back east, and I lived in Connecticut, it, you don't really think about Texas. You can't imagine what it's like. I mean, you have the, the fantasies of the tumbleweed and cowboys and all that, but it, it sounds ridiculous to say that. But um, when I interviewed in College Art Association for this job in, uh, as a matter of fact, um, well, in 1994, the, the, the committee that was interviewing me was so, um, so from, from Texas, they were all from Texas, was so, uh, I don't know, I'd never met this kind of um, reception, you know, working in the museum world on the East Coast. Um, just very inclusive in their thinking, very enthusiastic. Um, they really just uh, had the belief that this little gallery that they had, which had become rather lackluster due to lack of funds primarily, um, could become something. So um, anyway, I got, the, got to a final interview and uh, I see that this image is of the um, driveway into the university. It's considered one of the most beautiful university campuses in the United States, Rice University. And though this picture doesn't show it, um, in the spring on both sides of this road are azalea, pink azalea bushes about the size of Volkswagens. I mean, they're, they're, it's so beautiful, so striking. So for a person coming in February or early March, I guess, for this interview, where it was a blizzard, freezing cold, ice on the roads, um, just you know the worst possible weather, this was really like that moment in *The Wizard of Oz*, you know, when um, Dorothy steps into Oz and everything, you know, becomes Technicolor. So that was the beginning. And then you saw the gallery space. It, we walked to the gallery space. We par you know, park, walked to the gallery space. Of course, this, this is a work that was done you know, much later uh, by Shiguro Ban. And 
the thing about the gallery, um, it's almost a perfect square, and the, so is the plaza. The plaza really mirrors the, um, the interior, and several of the artists who would come um, actually saw the plaza and decided they wanted that openness of, of the um, being outside and the oaks and so forth, and that was the case with Shigoro. So, um, and this is this is when you when I walked in, um, this is actually quite light. It it wasn't as light as this now. I think they had the skylights um, then, rather. I, I think they had the skylights covered up, but. What really struck me was what was on view at the time, and if you just picture these walls marching in, you know, a rigid line, all at the same height, um, framed photographs, all the same size, you know, that was the, um, the exhibition, and it seemed like the gallery, to me, it seemed empty, you know, like that if you had this space, would you do that? Would you just choose to use the perimeter? And this is what the, the space looks like from the inside. And, and if you notice the, um, the black lines um, of the holding up the windows, that's, that became the motif for the book. And because the, the gallery is, is a big white box, it's 40 by 44 feet, a 16 foot high ceiling, and it has this open front wall of glass. Um, and really this, in, in some ways, this facade um, of the glass is the star of the gallery. And so it becomes like a, a jewel box or something that you can look into and defines you know, what you're seeing before you actually enter. Um, there's a little small satellite gallery to the back. Um, I don't think it, it doesn't appear, I don't believe in any of the uh, images we'll show this evening. It, some artists would use it, they would choose to use it for one thing or another, um, or do something that connected with their installation. And other artists uh, chose to have that wall, you know, uh, plastered over or sheetrocked over and plastered, so it just became a plain space. And this is the, the gallery foyer, which um, at that time, was one of the busiest spots on campus because it was a direct route from the campus, all the buildings on campus, into the faculty club, which is where everybody went for lunch. And also it was a space, um, this whole building was full and it was a space for students, you know, changing classes. So it's, it's empty here and I, th I think it's probably empty today, but at that time it was a, it was a great um, place for passers-by and that played, definitely played a role in thinking about what we would do there. And can you tell the story about when you had the insight to, to, you know, when you realized what you needed to do with the gallery, the mission? Well, the, um, it, was a, it was really kind of difficult, even though the uh, faculty had so much um, faith and enthusiasm for what could be done with this space, but really the budget was $10,000 a year. And that included everything, anything you would need built for an exhibition, your copy, your paper, pens, you know, everything had to come out of that tiny amount of money. And so there were several uh, installations and, and exhibitions as well that we did early on, you know, trying to use ingenuity to, you know, do them within this budget. Um, but really, there... I was just working really late in the office one night and kind of despairing of how this was really going to work um, without any money and without any fundraising apparatus. So I, I walked out into the empty space and I was, just sta I was literally just standing there like 10 o'clock at night and, and the, the idea you know, just came, this is a perfect space for installation. And if we do one thing, you know, we can put a lot of things to the side and just focus on, on doing a really great job with that. So that became, that really became our mission. And people, different artists worked with the architecture in different ways. So yes, I, I, as I said, I had worked in, at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in, in Connecticut, which um, at that time had a large loan collection, um, the collection of Saul and Carol LeWitt, and Solowit being, you know, 
a very important artist of, of our time. I'm, he's deceased now, but um, anyway, so, you know, getting to work with conceptual art and, um, and minimalist art and so forth, maybe that was another good foundation for working with this pristine space. But there came a point where, um, again, you know, with, without having raised a lot of money yet, um, I just asked Saul if he would do an installation for us. And it really was one, became one of the most extraordinary installations, um, glossy and flat black squares in 1997, in which he perfectly articulated, um, you know, the, the measurements, um, you know, the proportions of the gallery. And we wound up um, actually, you know, decades later in reinstalling this installation as the last exhibition at the gallery. Um, and, you know, the thing is that because it is site specific, this can never be replicated unless that same space, um, you know, to those proportions is reconstructed. So it is in the catalog raisonne, um, but I think pretty much these, the, this documentation is it. This is it. And so this was the very, very last. This, this, is the, what, this image is from the second installation in 2017. Yeah, and you it seemed see fitting. The shininess um, of the glossy and flat. Because it, in the beginning, sorry, excuse me, it seemed fitting because, you know, when we, show, when we had this installation, we were immediately catapulted, you know, into um, a level, you know, with Saul's work that we never would have had otherwise. And it made it possible for, um, you know, for us to go on and attract other artists of great stature. For this installation, the first time it was installed, um, Dominic de Menil, the founded the Menil Collection in Houston, came to the gallery one day, her daughter brought her, and she came in by herself. I mean, I, I was there and she just asked for a chair um, so we just gave her a simple folding chair, and she sat in the gallery, I would say, for more than a half an hour, just uh, taking in, you know, the experience of, of being in the space. And I wondered, you know, if it was going through her mind at the time also, you know, the, um, you know, the correlation with the Rothko Chapel, if you've ever seen pictures of Houston's Rothko Chapel. Um, not not the same by any means, but uh, in, perhaps in feeling mm -hmm. a correspondence. So in just speaking of um, how artists uh, over the years came to understand the space, and when, an art, when we would finally, we would get an artist, we would bring them to Houston for a site visit, and that became the time they could spend time in the gallery, really be in the space, talk to us, you know, we talked about what they might do. Many artists uh, saw the gallery from looking in, from, from the foyer looking in, and, and had their flash of insight, um, you know, right at that moment. And that was true of this artist, Swedish artist Gunilla Klingberg, who was the only artist who ever um, created an installation that, that revealed in, in a very um, striking way that really the, the foyer and the gallery space were simply one large space. And this curtain wall of glass, you know, was a very thin division in a way. When you think of a theater and the proscenium arch and the stage and how, you know, when you, you know, that's a different reality. That's what you're expecting when you go in. And that's how this, this thin glass wall really acted that way. It became the province of art in, inside. So um, the fact that she, you know, created this unity and showed what this space really was, was a pretty remarkable thing. And her work incorporated the local logos. Of, yes, uh, you know. her work, um, which she's done many public uh, large commissions in Europe and so forth, she, uh, yes, she collects the all of the, as many as she can, logos of the um, environment where she's going to make the piece. And if you look here, you can see, um, I don't know, do you have Fiesta um, stores here? That's a big grocery store I know in Houston. 
Um, Dairy Queen, of course, founded in Texas, Target, um, Imperial, Imperial Sugar. Sugar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are oil companies, you know, so uh, you have to really look, but it was wonderful how people would come in and, you know, they'd be struck by the, the piece. Uh, often children would naturally circumambulate the piece. They knew exactly what to do, as children <laughs> always do. Um, but then all of a sudden, they'd have the surprise of seeing these very familiar logos. So it was a wonderful installation. This installation um, called All of the Above by Judy Pfaff, um, who is really one of the pioneers of installation art and one of its most influential practitioners, was extraordinary. Um, I mean, having said, you know, saying that as one who experienced it, you see the screen, what I call the screen, which reminds me, at least, going back to the years when we didn't just maybe listen to the radio on our phones, you know, listening to the radio and having to tune it, you know, to, to the station. And, you know, you'd get the static and you would have to really listen until you, you know, you crisply got on to that correct spot. And that's what her, that's what she, how she handled the glass. It, it seemed very kind of electric uh, in feeling. And it also was, it was a kind of a screen that both revealed and hid what you were you know, going to be able to enter to see. The way Judy works um, is a really extraordinary way of working. She does not plan in advance. Uh, there's nothing, there's no sketch. As a matter of fact, for the announcement for this show, she set up kind of a, a fake scene of what she was doing in her studio for me because I asked for that, but she never actually does that kind of planning. So she brought all of this, uh, these interesting materials, um, these discs and iron balls. This is, uh, there was a gigantic tree uprooted from her property in Tivoli, uh, New York, upstate New York, which she dyed with ink. Um, you know, the fluorescent uh, plexiglass, you know, there was a tremendous amount of drawing on the walls. But the thing about this installation that the pictures, unfortunately, can never reveal is that the feeling when you were in there, and I guess you just have to take my word for it, when I first walked into this, I really felt like uh, a sense that the gallery had been expanded, that it was bigger somehow, and it was really like that sensation in a dream where you, you find another room in your house that you didn't know was there. It, it was very much like that. And Judy, had, when she came to the gallery, she had uh, stood in the middle of the gallery and looked out at the plaza, which kind of extended, extends the visual space, and said, this is the biggest little space I've ever been in. And that's exactly how it felt, much bigger than its actual measurements. This was an, actually an earlier show than this, but um, we had this show, I believe we had this show right after Salawit. I guess we were feeling, feeling our oats that we could, you know, invite an artist such as Yayoi Kusama to our, our tiny unknown space. And with the help of the, uh, the one museum in the United States uh, that's dedicated to installation art, that precedes us, preceded us, the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh. Uh, they had done a, a huge show of, I don't know, six or eight installations that took up their entire building. And we asked would they help us with communication, which at that time was fax, um, to communicate with Yayoi and see if she would, would do some, you know, uh, alter one of her installations for our space. And she did. And we communicated with her by fax, by you know, sending pictures, uh, such as it were, and, and you know, measurements and information. And she sent us, just one day, it appeared, what looked like a huge freezer chest. And we were so disappointed because we didn't, uh, we opened it and we saw this, these limp, there were a number of limp balloons inside, but we were like, this is never going to fill this gigantic space. But once they began um, being blown up with a shop vac, you know, they just fit in there. And she also sent uh, some large panels, um, paper or cardboard panels or something that had uh, the stickers for the dots, 
We had to paint the ceiling yellow. She requested that and also that the front of the gallery would be covered in yellow mylar to, you know, emphasize this space. And, you know, many of you may know that Yayoi, um, her whole, her iconography of these dots, this, this is called Dots Obsession, and, and many of her works are called Dots Obsession, um, comes from when she was a very young child, just sitting at the kitchen table, and, you know, much like having that flash of insight, all of a sudden she saw polka dots covering the surface of the table, moving on to the, the cabinets and, and, you know, really encompassing the whole space. So that's a motif that, that uh, I believe she's in her 90s now, um, certainly in her late 80s, I think in her 90s. Um, she lives in a mental hospital in Tokyo and has for quite some time. And anyway, and this is one of the, um, but this was the first time she had been shown in Houston, so people were just, um, blown away to see what this was. Yes, I mean, she is a, such a household name today. Yeah. And, and uh, again, Kim brought her to, to Texas for the first time. And you never painted the ceiling again after this. this is no, we couldn't. Time. I mean, I, it's hard to believe we even did that, had it spray painted uh, that we, you know, I guess this must have been when we started getting, getting some money. <laughs> getting some, um, getting some r rules in place. Yeah, anyway, and so it was great. But yeah, we could never do it again. <laughs> This artist uh, was another artist that used the space in a similar way to Yayoi in that it took you to a place that you had never been and you didn't know where you were. But in a sense, he was the opposite, uh, Stefan Hendy, because he completely, um, you know, obliviated the architecture. And this artist who was from New Jersey, um, just asked for one thing. He came, he saw the space, he knew what he wanted to do, and he wanted to be allowed to work alone, completely alone, in the gallery for three weeks over the Christmas break when nobody was, was there. And I mean, he literally worked alone, this is him on the scaffold, even doing the whole ceiling. Um, he only had, the materials were white foam core, just like anyone can buy in the art store, black gaffer's tape, as is used in the theater, and shop lights from Home Depot, uh, over which you just put a piece of green gel. And so with just these materials, he created this work, Super Thrive, which he likened to being inside of a video game at, at the time. And uh, it was really about the kind of relentless, uh, unceasing growth you know, the growth of cities, the, the growth of agriculture, that, you know, just the way things were going in the world. And it was 2000, this... this yeah, so it was quite, yeah, quite long ago. So it was a lot of long it about ago. the, like, internet anxiety and... Yes, definitely. And this was the, probably the favorite installation of what we always refer to as the science side of campus. Um, the scientists packed in for this and were just, you know, in, in awe, but... We had built tunnels on the outside, so it would be very dark. You would be used to the dark, or sort of used to the dark, you know, before you ever got into the space. Yeah, I remember this one, the entrance was completely blacked out, and so you went through this black tunnel, and you did not know what you were going to walk into the first yeah, time. Yeah, it was and very disorienting in a good way. It was very disorienting, and, and he, I think he was the only ar artist who completely disregarded the architecture, or completely yes. you know, built into it. Um, it was extraordinary. Um, again, now this, this artist, uh, um, Yusuke, I'm sorry, Yasu Onishi, um, from Japan, he spoke no English. Um, his assistant there, Ayami, was the translator. Um, this was certainly, this was a great um, example. People always, always ask me how we find the artists, and there were many ways we found them, but in this case, a colleague called me, called me one night, who, and she was, at an opening at her university um, in, in Philadelphia, and she said, you, you have to get this artist. You know, we, they had had him there for a two-week um, residency, and, you know, he had done an exhibition in their gallery, and she said, there, I've never seen anything like this. So anyway, we did get, you know, get him to come, invited him to come, 
And uh, what he wound up doing was called reverse of volume, RG, being Rice Gallery, because he did other reverse pieces. And um, he, he, this entire installation was, again, created with the simplest of means. Black glue, black hot glue, cardboard boxes, and, you know, just the cheap, uh, like, 99-cent drop cloths you can buy in the hardware store for painting. Um, so you can see a little bit here. We, we showed this to show you kind of how he went about it. He started with some... Uh, just some, um, what do you call it, strips that we had put in the ceiling, very thin wooden strips, and literally built these glue lines. He essentially was drawing in space and built these glue lines uh, dripping, dripping down. And he, he set up the cardboard in a way that, you know, um, he could drape the sheets over it. So you can get a better, better idea of it here. One way, kind of hate to reveal the the secret, as it were, but it's, it is interesting to see how he did this, and he did it just with that one assistant. And you see the massive, um, again, changing of this um, very austere architectural space with this beautiful cloud-like uh, structure that, again, it was, it was really awesome when you were in there. And also, you could look up, and it was like seeing a myriad of drawings, different drawings from the glue. And then when you looked at it right from afar, from outside of the gallery, it was like a, a giant thunderstorm was coming down through the, the clouds. And I, I really, um, I, as I look at this now, I still think it's amazing that he could do this with, with that. And I. I do think that this is the theme of the Rice Gallery, which is um, installation artists in general. They're artists who, uh, they are craving to work in a large space. Some of our artists, I, I believe the next one we're gonna see, you know, some of them had never made works bigger than, you know, a shoebox. But in, in seeing their work and talking with them, you knew that they would be able to handle this kind of space. And not all artists are, they're neither interested in nor really capable of, you know, dealing with a massive volume. This artist, Anna Serrano in Los Angeles, um, our curator, Josh Fisher, just saw a picture of her little houses, which in fact were the, the size of a shoebox or smaller, online. She had done one work that was sort of a huge um, kind of stack of these. But, but these little houses were remarkable in that the, everything was made just out of cardboard. And the way she, she came up with her, her inspiration was from her walks that she would take around Los Angeles. Um, you know, she would walk in the uh, Mexican-American neighborhoods. Um, she was fascinated by the creativity of how the buildings were treated. You know, you had this building with the barbed wire on the top and all the, whatever they are, the air conditioning units or something, and the, the meters. And she would extract these uh, details and make them so beautifully, just, you know, hand make them out of cardboard. Um, and, you know, this is like a, a high voltage building, but it's pink. You know, and she said there would be a building that would be a garage and in the same building would next door be a pinata shop. So the way they divided that was just painting the building two different colors. You know, or the beautiful fences. Um, so anyway, um, we asked uh, you know, her to come up with an installation and she decided to create a Salon of Beauty, which was um, a phrase that she had seen on the side of a beauty parlor um, in Spanish. I think it was, Sal I don't speak Spanish, I think it was Salon de, Salon de Belleza. Be oh, that's, thank you, that's right. But it was translated into English. But it was translated as, Salon, instead of saying beauty salon, it was Salon of Beauty, much more beautiful. And so uh, that, that somehow was the inspiration for this. So this is her working on the scale model, and this is her at Rice Gallery. Every single piece of her installation was handmade by her. Um, here she is, you know, putting up a tile wall made from the individual cardboard tiles that, that she had made. 
Um, again, it was extraordinary. When you, uh, I was just looking back before this talk at some of the comments people made who saw this installation. Um, many people saw it who were from Mexico and were just um, enchanted. It really took them, took them back. Uh, they cited specific instances in the guest book. Um, you know, it, it, she feels also that this is uh, the way she works is kind of a political statement because without beating it over people's heads, you know, just by using humor um, and the very simple materials and so forth, and it just gives you a chance to see, you know, a way of life, um, a very beautiful and valid way of life that you might not otherwise uh, see unless you live in one of these neighborhoods. So you walk through the whole thing and, you know, ATM, there's a, a, the liquor store, all the, the buildings that would be u ubiquitous. Um, houses, you know, you can see they have the bars in the window, but they're wonderful little tiled uh, garden areas out front. There was uh, a, beauty, a beauty shop, a bakery with a huge wedding cake, tiered wedding cake in the window. A triple X place. Yeah, oh, right, a, a, some kind of a porn place, a, trickle, a triple X place. I mean, they were all really the elements that you would experience, you know, walking through a, an average um, Los Angeles neighborhood like this. And just to explain, the, the windows that you see that look so realistic are photographs. So she would photograph doors and windows. Right. Or like that, the AC unit you saw in the previous picture and put the photographs on the cardboard. Yeah, even the, even the barbed wire that she made by hand was so beautiful. Um, you know, it was just an incredibly crafted um, work, you know, with so many elements. Oops, sorry. Um, this was actually um, right before Solowit. So this was before, before Solowit, this was our final installation. And by that time, people knew that the gallery was going to be closed. And so you'll see in a following um, slide that they saw, this, they saw this work set up in the gallery, which was called Cubicle, and they thought the gallery had already been transformed into an office space. And this is Jonathan Shipper, who was, was here, who did one of these uh, sessions here at the Modern. He, he you know, wanted to have a completely realistic office space, and we were very fortunate that University of Houston um, you know, we just looked around, where, where could we get this without, you know, buying it? Um, they were redoing an office and gave us an entire office suite of furniture and came and assembled it in for us. But the fun for our staff was fleshing it out in a way that people do make their, you know, their spaces. I've worked in a cubicle before. <laughs> you know, you try to make it your own space. Um, so there was some wonderful, you can see in this picture, in the, in the rear, um, well, no, actually in the center, toward the back, the coffee station, you know, the water. The and, abject snack area. Yeah, the <laughs> snack area, the little table where, you know, very unglamorous, you know, lunches brought from home, you know, could be eaten. Um, all kinds of things, you know, just way too many files, files everywhere staplers, you know, paper punches, post-its, you name it. And each one of these stations uh, we made to have a specific personality. And actually, Rice, Rice staff, who are always wonderful, um, the staff and the students in contributing to these installations, they, they brought pictures from home and, you know, their own cartoons and things, you know, the adding machine. Really, you could walk any place in the university and see pretty much the same scene. But here, oh, wait. attached to every single object, just basically every single object, was a string. And behind the wall, what, you, what visitors could not see was, I guess it was about six foot tall, an enormous winch, the kind of winch used in shipyards to, you know, pulled the boats out of, the, the ships out of water. So Jonathan Shipper's work is largely about time, you know, the um, inevitable um, passing of time, the unavoidable passing of time, and how it's happening right now so slowly that we don't even see it. 
And so his installations are revealed over time by everything being pulled, pulled toward a, a, a point, a hole. And so throughout this installation, it would change every day. Or we'd be in the office and we would hear some filing cabinet, you know, it just crashed to the floor. Um, you know, just everything. There were, there were plants that we kind of felt sorry for because they were living plants and they were, you know, they'd go over and their dirt would be on the floor and we would just have to leave them that way. But everything uh, point, added and pointed to the inexorable change that is time. And it was, it's in the book, I should know this. I think it was like a millimeter per hour or something. Yeah, it was, it was so it not a visible. Weeks for this to. Yeah, oh yeah, I think hurt. it was like probably either, maybe six weeks, four to six weeks, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. So anyway, there came that, that day when everything had reached the end. <laughs> and there, and we have, I have to say that we did feel at that time it was a perfect statement of our, the fate of the Rice Gallery. Um, but it was, it was just a fabulous um, installation. So, and so enjoyable. And this was an earlier one. This was 98 or something. This was... We didn't want to end on that note. <laughs> but we wanted to... Uh, and, you know, we, we, bought, we have used the time, but, you know, there are so many more. Obviously, we, we hope you may be interested in seeing them in the book. I would like to also say that if you go home tonight and you haven't, don't have your copy yet, um, just look up ricegallery.org, and all of these installations, uh, all 72 of them, are on the website. And also um, the text, you know, many of the, all the catalogs are on there, so you can, in some cases, read the artist's own words about the installations. Um, but we wanted to show this last because, again, it is a beautiful campus, and this was an installation by... Karim Rashid, who's an internationally renowned uh, product designer, and Pleasurescape was the name of his installation. And it was centered, uh, it was a, a big, I don't know if we have a, have a picture of that, I think we do later. It was a big, what he called a scape, a big plastic scape that you could um, sit in, lounge in, study in, read in. But the thing that was interesting was the way he expanded his work and expanded it really onto the campus was by painting, having us paint. Look, I think we must have painted the ceiling then too. I think yeah. there was another ceiling painting. Yeah, so that was an early, early one. <laughs> that must have been the last time. Um, this room was so, when you were in it in person, because it was day glow paint, it was so intense. And then at night, it just radiated out. You know, you saw, you saw this. Um, you saw this glow, you know, as soon as you turned the corner and, and saw the gallery. So um, that was an interesting way, you know, conceptually as well, to extend the space of the, of the space. And it was, and as a, you know, an alum who had come back to Houston and was interested in art and watching art, I mean, it, it, sounds, it sounds corny, but it's true. It was a beacon on the campus, and it was, it was such an attractive and amazing moment on the campus and so important. So it was, it was truly wonderful. It was also very unusual. Um, anybody that's been on a university campus, I don't think I've been on, ever been on another university campus where the art, at that time, the art gallery was at the very front, the main entrance, where, and where the visitor parking was. So it was very easy. I, I didn't say what our mandate was, and one of the aspects of the mandate I was given was to do something that was, well, first of all, not being done, replicated by you know, anyone in town, but also to, to have it be exciting enough that it would bring people to campus. And so we did get to the point where we would have you know, a minimum of 400 people at an opening. So we did fulfill that. And you always had mariachis and kegs of beer. Yeah, we, we always made it fun. It was so, always fun. And we made it fun for the artists so they would go back and spread the word that you have to get, go to Rice Gallery. <laughs> so. and, and, and there we are. There we are, yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you. There, there were 72 installations. So again, buy the book in the Fort Worth Modern Bookshop. <laughs>
I would, I would like to point out, I, I don't know where he is, oh, that Chad Benedict, who uh, was a student at Rice, um, in the very beginning of the gallery, and was really our top docent over a 20 year plus year um, history, came from Austin to, to be here tonight. You know, I, I thank you. And he was such, such a wonderful addition. Um, when I think back to those very early years of the gallery and his close eye on the, on the work, <laughs> keeping it safe. Well, does anyone have any questions in the room? Anyone? Yes. You mentioned that um, sign of not um, disappearing in the, um, the gallery closed. So did it close and reopen? Or did it just <laughs> no, it just, it just closed. Um, the, the question was uh, the, whether the gallery closed or how it closed. Oh, the gallery um, closed in um, May of... Uh, 2017. 2017. I was thinking 1997. In 2017, um, yes, it was it was a, a very abrupt closing. It had actually been planned for quite some time, but you know we didn't know that. But um, they had been building um, a center on the other side of campus, an art center that would combine academia more with you know with art. And so it's a Moody Center for the Arts, which is a building um, that's primarily classrooms, but does have uh, several very large gallery spaces, you know, in the lower part. And they've been doing a fantastic job. They've con they've actually continued, you know, doing some installations. Um, they've had some fabulous shows. I was looking in your shop at the Micheline Thomas catalog. They had, you know, a large show of her work. It was very exciting. So, you know, time moves on, and it was just time for something new. I didn't mention that we did get money <laughs> as time went on, and that was because there are such wonderful philanthropists in Houston, and we never, ever could have had this gallery, um, which functions solely on the contributions raised by this patron group. Um, Mrs. Louisa Seraphim and Isabel uh, Wilson started a patron group um, and to raise a certain amount per year. And through the whole time of the gallery, um, we, we did wind up raising that amount or sometimes surpassing it. But without them, um, that would not have been possible. But I, and I, the story is in the book, but I love the story because these, these women or the group of people who became the patrons were like, we will we'll fund your we'll fund the right. gallery, but all we want is that we don't have to serve on any committees or attend any meetings ever, and that you will host a dinner that we will pay for where you'll bring somebody interesting to come speak to us, and that's what we get in return. So all that came true, <laughs> and and yeah, also, ideal patrons. Yeah, and that then the reason we got them was again the the man who um, the head of the art and art history department, William Canfield, who's a very uh, famous scholar of. Dot on surrealism, and a wonderful, um, a wonderful human being born out the oil fields of West Texas. Um, he was the one who who really uh, was so respected that he. I mean, I I had no contacts in Houston, but he was able to um, request the meeting, you know, with Mrs. Seraphim that that got the ball rolling for us, and when we invited them to the gallery for a box lunch, which was all we could afford at that time, um, that very day, they made the commitment to start the patron group, which is what kept the gallery going.
Well, really, um, yes, you know, Whaley's on the way. And, you know, I, I, I think once we made the decision that this was all we were going to do, although I think we did have one or two shows we had to slip in, you know, for one reason or another. We didn't include those other exhibitions in, in this book. But, um, you know, we just, we, we just made it work. I mean, we knew how much money we had. We knew how we had to divide it. You know, we made, we made a whole system for contract and, and we just did, did have this philosophy of treating the artist extra well, as, you know, as well as we could, um, making good impression. And one thing that really helped us, um, and, and so we just, we went on. And um, when, we, when Josh, our assistant curator, I mean, our curator rather, came 10 years in, he was um, a computer genius. And I really attribute his being able to um, get the word out online, all the design publications, all the art publications, the international publications. I think we, you know, we became known that way. Um, and it, yeah, it just, it went on till it didn't go on anymore. And you know, when, it's, when it ended, I'm not gonna say that I wasn't sad at the time, but our gallery manager, who I'd worked with for so long, had retired. You know, in retrospect, I, I can see myself winding down and was extremely happy, you know, to retire after about a year. And then extremely happy, because without Rainey, this book never would have happened. So um, the thing about the book is that makes us so happy is that um, you know, uh, the gallery will exist. It will never be wiped off the map, you know, because everything was temporary. So nothing exists. This is the only document of it. Yeah, and this is the photography and, and so forth. That's, that's how it exists into the future. So, um, yeah, I mean, we just kept going. We had a small four to five person, no more than five people at any time, usually four, and our students. And, um, we made, I don't know, we just, it's like Tim Gunn said, we just made it work. <laughs> you know, we just made it work. That's true. Yeah. And they're often not made central. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the freedom, yeah. because we didn't. Uh, I mean. Two, two um, people were important, the artists, but also the public. It was very important to us to show work that, um, you know, you didn't need to read the label or, or you know what I mean? You didn't need to, someone to necessarily tell you it's about this. You could just experience it. It could be, uh, I went to Divinity School and they used to have a saying, Mrs. Murphy in the pew, don't ever speak above that because you want it to be understood. You know, that's the whole point. And we, we felt that we always wanted our installations to be exciting and, you know, something to really experience. And so we didn't really care about, uh, all we cared about was really the aesthetic and the, you know, working with the artist. We never looked for political exhibitions or, you know, tried to fulfill something other than using the space. And I, I do, I'll just say this final thing, I, I do think, I think it would be really difficult to do this anywhere else at any other time, um, now, now being familiar with academic life, because we had, because the gallery at the time when we started was, you know, not really significant to the university, we had complete freedom. I mean, we used to say that we, can do anything we want as long as we don't embarrass the university, and that is really how we operated. But you know, most university art galleries, um, maybe not the museums so much like Yale or something, but 
are, you know, run by the art department. And there's no uh, overlapping of, in real life, of academia and the making of art. So that's a problematic relationship often, not always, but often. So we didn't, we didn't have to worry about that. We, I made it a condition of being hired that we would eventually separate and become independent, and we did that. And to your point, or to your question, Terry, I was just gonna add two things. One, another thing about the gallery that was very special, aside from just the simplicity of the mission, there was the simplicity of the schedule. So there was an installation in the spring, an installation in the fall, and then over time you developed the summer window when the gallery was closed, but there was something to see in the behind the glass, um, but you couldn't enter in. And so as a member of the public outside of the, the gallery, you knew that there was always going to be something, in, something opening up kind of in January and something opening up kind of in o September, October. And then it would be up for several months so you could go back and experience it over time. Most of them didn't change over time, but sometimes they did. Um, so that just keeping things very simple, you know, was, was part of what made it so spectacular as a visitor. And then to the, the idea of it closing or things having their life cycle or whatever, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, this idea seems so obvious in retrospect, like all good ideas. Um, but I also, you know, because in 1995, you know, installation art wasn't necessarily an obvious thing. But nowadays, it's kind of everywhere. And we have the, the Van Gogh video, Spectacorama, immersive giga. And so, you know, I think that, I, I would never say that installation art has, has jumped the shark or run its course because, you know, we were going to talk a little bit about the history of it, as you saw in our Monet water lilies and the, uh, the, <laughs> the Giotto Chapel, but it's been around, it goes back arguably to cave paintings, certainly to the Sistine Chapel. So it's, it's going to be around us, this sense of an environmental art. But within the art world of, you know, the early 20th century, I mean, I think that people have started to glom onto this idea oh, yeah. and commercialize it, and it's gotten a little bit gross, too. Yes, but people, mm -hmm. but people um, you know, I mean, people, you can't fault people for just liking that experience, to have an experience. It's true. Because there aren't many, ex you know, outer experiences, thrilling, that we can have. You know, we're watching TV and, you know, so I think people just, they're longing for something wonderful. Um, that's true, that's true. And here I am denigrating it. And it's, no, but it's, no, but I, it's I, almost I like a spiritual or a desire for the sublime, that immersive no, thing where you're in an environment. Or going to the museum. That a sacred I mean? space where a church would have given you or whatever. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> we're babbling. <laughs> Any you. other You're babbling. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Oh. Question. I have just one question. What, what is taking place in the, that area, that the gallery? It's just a, um, it's a room full of chairs, and the windows are, shut, are closed off. You can't see inside. And so it's an orientation center. It's just going, you know, when students come, they call it a welcome it's a, it's center. It's a center. <laughs> No, not visitor, just um, just students, incoming students. I believe they have orientations in there. Yeah. Oh, rice. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yes, thanks again. Thank you. Thank